Hi, today we're going to take a look at the Aurora HDR 2018. This is the latest version of the software and this is our first software review. So let's see what it can do. Today we're going to take a look at the new HDR software called Aurora HDR. This is our first software review and what we are going to do is take a look at the interface, how it works and demonstrate what it can do using a couple of images. McFun, the company that makes Aurora HDR and dozens of other photography related applications and software, was founded by two college students almost 10 years ago and for years it was mostly known for creating all sorts of award winning Mac and iOS apps and software. Aurora HDR 2018 is part of a big move by the company to create a larger user base with PC software as well, which made the company change its name, which will now be called Skylum. As we have noted, the new Aurora HDR 2018 version is the first Mac and PC iteration of this software, and it also brings quite a few updates and improvements. So let's start by taking a look at the interface of the Aurora HDR software. This isn't going to be a full tutorial or anything of that sort. McFun, or actually Skylum now, has many great educational videos on their website which you might want to check out if this is what you're looking for. Instead, this will be our subjective look at what this piece of software can do, what it does well and where it might still need some improvement. After installing the software, we actually already had one major update by the way, which is nice, you can either drag images onto the software or open it and choose images to open and create an HDR. Do note that you don't have to use two or more images, you can just as easily work on a single image using a software, although you won't be getting any dynamic range boost in this way. It's worth mentioning that creating an HDR from several images does take a bit of time. We did a test with 5 raw images from our D7200 and it took just over 1 minute to merge all of them together. This might actually be a slight improvement over what the software did when it was first released and we possibly might see even a better performance in the future. Looking at the interface, when you just open the software, you're greeted with a pretty clean arrangement. You have all the basic menus on top including file, edit, layers, filters, tools, etc. Just below this line you have another role with a few options including opening a new image. From what we understand, and we might be missing something here, this software can only work on a single HDR image at any given time, but you can open several instances of the software to work on a number of images simultaneously. We actually prefer Adobe's approach in this respect as it is implemented in Photoshop for example where you have different tabs inside the software for different images, and maybe this is something worth changing in a future update of this software. On the same row, you also have the option to zoom in, which also works with a mouse scroll, as you would expect, and two tools for comparing your edit to the original, the eye and the before and after tool, which we actually prefer. It would also be nice if there was a tool for comparing before and after just for the last change that you have made, but this doesn't exist in this version. Next, you have the undo and history. The history option is a bit strange and needs some more developing in our view. The best way to implement this option will be to allow you to control each change, keep or remove it, or go back any number of steps in one go. This doesn't seem possible at this point. Next to this tool you have the interesting crop tool with all sorts of custom aspects ratio options. One thing which we found a bit odd is that you can only rotate the image 45 degrees to each side. This should probably be fixed to allow for a full rotation. On the right you have the preset overlay toggle and the layers and filters menu. We shall talk about them and what they include in a second, but the last option on this bar is the upload, which allows you to export or share your images quickly. More share options beyond Facebook and Twitter would probably be appreciated. So let's do a quick test of the software. We shall start with an image we took in Berlin, we did 7 different exposures of this image going from minus 3 EV to plus 3 EV. Creating this HDR took just over 1.5 minutes with our 6 core Intel CPU, 32GB of RAM and a fast SSD drive. Looking at the resulting HDR, even without doing anything, this image looks pretty decent, especially the sky. 
but let's see what we can do to make it just a little bit more interesting. We are going to start by looking at some of the pre-existing presets. You can choose between different categories or download more. Let's start with architecture and right off the bat you see that some of these looks very cool while others might be a bit too much, at least for our taste. But you can very easily control the amount of the effect the preset will have on your image so if something is too strong just go down until it looks fine. There are literally dozens of presets and finding the one you like can take time. Luckily you can mark your favorite ones and the next time you edit the image you can go back to those directly. Really cool. One thing that could use an improvement in the preset interface is a slider below. It is way too thin and a bit hard to drag. It should be made thicker and put above the presets and we would also add arrows on the sides to help you navigate more quickly. Starting with an existing preset that you like and then applying filters to tweak it to your own liking can be a great way to start, surely for beginners but even for more advanced users who want to move more quickly. This can be a good method especially since you can save your own preset filters, although at the moment we didn't find any way of deleting them. However for the moment and for demonstration purposes let's close the preset panel, make our image larger and focus our attention on the filters panel on the right. You have almost 15 submenus with dozens of options, we won't go over all of them but we can play with a few to see what they can do. The HDR basic menu will give you the normal temperature, tint, exposure and contrast options that you have on almost any image editing software, but it also has the HDR enhance option which makes your image look much more alive and at least on this image even at 100% it still looks relatively natural. The smart tone seems to brighten or darken the image and in this case we would maybe play with the shadows just a tiny bit. Next, it could be a good idea to add just a bit of vibrance to this image as well as some color contrast which actually works very nice. We actually suggest that you never overdo color enhancements unless this is your original intention. Now we're getting into the really interesting stuff. Under the HDR structure we can add or subtract from the HDR look of the image. Adding too much looks very artificial. Subtracting will make the image look much softer and smoother. You can also add softness manually or boost the whole HDR for a super artificial look. Playing with the HDR microstructure actually proves useful and maybe more subtle. You can see the effect it has if you zoom in a bit. Next we have the denoise option but on this particular image it seems to do more harm than good as you can see. Image radiance also doesn't seem to play very nice with this particular image making everything washed out but you can add vividness and it might look a bit better. The polarizing filter effect is really cool and I'm not sure if something similar and that simple exists in Adobe software. Do note that on some images, like this one for example, it will make chromatic aberrations much more noticeable and we didn't find any specific built-in tool to address that, something that you can find on both Lightroom and Photoshop. Next you have a lot of control on how many HDR details you can add to the image in this case, some small detail enhancements seems to work well as you can see when we zoom in. You can also add glow to your image, in this case it looks very much like the image radiance so we shall just leave this turned off. For images where you want to apply some changes only to one of the sides you have a specific tuning options. This is nice for landscape images with skies and or water but it isn't really relevant for this image in particular. Next you have your tone curve with options to play with specific colors, we will just add an ever so small S curve here. It would have been nice if there was an option to control the percentage by which the filter is applied and on the more complex filters turn on and off each particular option to see how it affects the image. Next we have two sets of advanced color filters with lots of options to play with specific colors and tones. I'm going to leave these as they are for this image. The last two filters are the dodge and burn and vignette. The burn or lighten tool can be used to make some of the darker patches in the image a bit brighter. We did notice that some of the shortcut buttons that we used for Adobe software such as the increase and decrease brush size do not work and the redo shortcut also does not seem to do anything. Looking at some forums it seems that other users have faced this as well so we are hoping that this will be fixed soon. Now that we finally finished editing this image we can look at the before and after. Quite a huge difference. 
Do note that the before image seems to be one of the original images before the software combined everything to HDR, which by itself had a bit of impact. It would be nice if we can also go back to the first combined HDR easily and compare it with the edit. There are of course more features and functions that you can work with such as lens correction as well as working with masks and layers, but for a good basic demonstration, this should be enough to give you an understanding on what this software can and can't do. So let's conclude this review. We have to admit that we were really pleasantly surprised by this software. We normally do all of our editing work in Photoshop and although you can do HDR in Photoshop and have all of the powerful Adobe tools in your disposal, if you are serious about shooting images with higher dynamic range, architecture, landscape, etc. and want to streamline your work, we would highly recommend that you consider Aurora HDR 2018. It is not as if making HDR images in Photoshop is that difficult, but it tends to be something that we postpone because it can be a lot of work and a bit tedious at times. We shot the image that we just processed for this video in 2015 along with many other bracketed shots in Berlin but we never found the time or energy to process them all in Photoshop. With Aurora the whole process is a lot easier and even a bit of fun which makes the chances of us processing all these HDR shots much more likely. And after all isn't that what it's all about? As for pricing, when the Aurora HDR 2018 was first announced this September, there was a pre-order price of $89, but it ended and the official price now is $99. Luckily, McFan were kind enough to give Lens with viewers the same pre-order discount. Just use the link below or the one in the full article. So to sum things up, what do you think after using the software for over a month? Well, our answer is this. If you just happen to shoot bracketed shots here and there and have a different editing solution, this might be more than you need. But if you're even a little bit serious about these landscape and architectural shots, Aurora HDR 2018 is really going to save you time and open new creative possibilities for you. And hey, we no longer have any excuses not to process all these HDR shots that we took in Berlin. So this was a look at the Aurora HDR software. You can read the full review on lensvid.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find more videos just like this. See you next time.